like many, we want to change the world. And we want to do that in a place that is similar to the place we live. This is a place in Central Asia, very much like our valley here in Montana, except that tonight it's minus 40 degrees there, and tomorrow the high is minus 17 Fahrenheit, and there's ice fog until noon. So we're just at the border of Siberia. And migration is the way of life of these nomads. It's the critical way that they can take the kitchen sink and the stove and go out of the valley into the high country to escape the winter cold air inversions and to find better grass for their animals. So movement becomes critical to, sustain, to sustainability. A school child artist shows us the daily life centered around the Mongolian gear with horses, other domestic animals. Oh, and look, the accoutrements of civilization are there too. They don't live in a bubble. They live just like we do from day to day using things at hand from outside and inside. The Mongolian horse culture is critical. Horses are for society, they're for movement, they're for migration. Kids grow up on horses before they can walk and this forms the basis of a mobile society and provides the mystique of Mongolian horses. A bridger bowl hat and gloves keep this child warm. Too young to ride a horse, but okay to go in the box on the fall seasonal migration. Again, the key to mobility and getting to new grass and getting away from cold winter camps. Very critical. Bachelun is greeting the morning by greeting the four, the four directions with fresh milk in front of her family gear where family life occurs. So again, the movable gear, warm in winter, cool in summer if you roll up the sleeves and let the air come by, becomes the focus of how these people live in this place with their animals, such as the Mongolian fat-tailed sheep here coming every night for protection against predators, supplying Mongolians with meat, with a little bit of dairy, and especially with wool for felting to make the walls of the gear warm in winter and cool in summer. Shamanism is the spiritual base of wealth for this part of Mongolia. We see the sacred horse. We see the blue prayer flags that represent the color of the Mongolian blue sky. And we see direction in connection with the spirits of nature, directions for our daily lives through this very fundamental awareness. This awareness is built on by the revival of Tibetan Buddhism in Mongolia, purged away from Mongolia during the Stalinist era, Soviet era, and now coming back again, providing the basis for family life, for decisions about life and death, for funerals and births, so another part of the spiritual wealth. So what are the other things we're seeing? Changes in transportation. Those saddlebags aren't Harley-Davidson. Those are rawhide horse saddlebags, and Socht and his wife have come 80 kilometers to get flour, sugar, and rice, not by horse, but by cycle. The monk has just given the spring blessing for Children's Day, and now I'm not sure what he's up to, but he's got the itch with the hand along the ear. So communication is allowing the leapfrogging of technology in Mongolia, as well as we're seeing here, but in this case, it's much faster. Children, regimented schools, sort of a holdover from the Soviet time, some parents still want the regimentation and the top-down control as opposed to our way, which is more bottom-up. But everyone is literate. So Mongolians have a tremendous gift to the world of almost universal literacy and awareness. The yaks, animals fit for place. We think that harvesting yak hair can lead to high-end manufacture that can help to reduce the number of cashmere goats in this valley thereby reducing erosion and desertification. So taking advantage of animals that live here. There is a small population of reindeer herders on the fringe of the valley. They are isolated from their Russian cousins by the artificial political border. So even though they are resilient with their standard traditional practices, they have TV and cycles, they're really in danger of extinction because of politics. This girl, knows how to chop wood and carry water. Those fundamental skills of growing up that we wish more of our kids could learn how to practice, maybe in the Ruby Zitzer form 
of living by canoe in the wilderness. I didn't think I'd ever see a person using a travois, but this woman is, has a ticket to spending the winter in her family gear high in the mountains with her family not being separated. So generations stay together as long as they possibly can. Another one of those really important threads of family life that is in the Mongolia tradition. And are these people happy? Are they expressive? Music is, again, a part of Mongolian tradition. And these people, in spite of other music that comes in through globalization, continue to practice their own traditional music. And we see the expression and the emotion that this builds. I like to sit on the ground. How many of you like to sit on the ground and remember how to do that? It's a habit of traditional people that Europeans have lost. And it's healthful. It's a way to visit. How many of us have sat on the ground since July's Sweet Pea Festival? <laughs> the Mongolian ingenuity or way of getting things done, if something breaks, let's find some native materials. Let's pull up our skills and let's fix it by golly. It might take blood, sweat, and tears, but it can be done in Ah, oh, these people are probably cousins to lots of Montana ranchers. So this girl, as she grows, has the advantage of the traditional skills that her family will teach her. She also has the advantages of modern education. As she goes forward into the world, we hope that she can leapfrog over mistakes that we've made, that she can teach us, and that we can all be better for this interchange. <laughs> 